I told you, this place throws out explosives. You can make Tanner... Oh my god! Hi there! I... Uh, I didn't see you. Today we're talking about handguns. Handgun history is complicated and vast and goes all over the place. I couldn't make one video about this if I wanted to. Let me just get rid of this evidence and then... And probably smarter to just change. Give me two seconds. Uh, pop. There we go. So we're going to put a series together. Handgun Historian, because there's a lot to dive into and it's worth knowing. It's kind of a cognito hazard in that knowing about it may turn you into a geek like me. It's like zombies, but instead of eating brains, we're eating MREs. Today is going to cover a bunch of fun stuff. Pipe bombs, horse cum, corporate cannibalism, and at one point I say the words schloppy cock wiffle ball. So you've got that to look forward to, worth sticking around for on its own, I think. But before we get into all of that, I get to thank my Patreon supporters. This channel is entirely viewer supported. I get to call Serpa a dumb pile of fuck because the only person I shill for is you, the viewers. I hope you see this as a place where you can learn and grow as a shooter, and if that has utility to you, I'd love to see you join us over on Patreon. Anyway, let's get into it. Beretta was started in 1526 to make arquebus barrels. In terms of gun development, this is all the way back in the pipe bomb on a stick that you can sort of aim era. Like, the gun parts they were selling were arming militaries whose main long arms were pikes and fucking leprosy. The Beretta you're most likely familiar with is the M9 platform, the military variant of their Model 92 handgun, which can trace its roots to the 1951, which was itself inspired by the Walther P38, with a piece of tracing paper, at least in the loading tank assembly and rear slide. And Walther wasn't going to say shit because, well, the company literally didn't exist in 1951, we'll get back to Walther in a minute. The M9 was the standard sidearm for the US from 1990 until 2017, when it was finally replaced. Ish, asterisk. Last one got replaced in 2021 for a number of reasons, not the least of which being pistols are frankly less relevant in an age of soldiers with modern body armor and not radically different in their design these days. In addition to the M9, they've recently made noise with the ADX, a modernization of the Beretta 84, famous for being used by Trinity in the Matrix. Dodge this. The ADX continues the tradition of being an M9 that got left in the dryer by shrinking the modern features of the A4. The other is the APX, which is striker-fired and frequently sold with massive discounts as nobody cares about the also-ran. That's a theme you'll discover in this series. It seems like everybody has the pistols they've developed and also one copy of the Austrian kid. Speaking of the person whose homework got passed around like chips at a party, Gaston Glock the prolific manufacturer of firearms and horse cum aficionado passed recently, which... Wait, what the fuck did I just say? That's a joke, but there is Glock-branded horse cum. Glock started out as a manufacturer of everything that he could get a government contract to make. Curtain rods, umbrellas... He eventually moved on to knives for the military. He bought plastic equipment to make the handles and sheaths for the knives in the first place, and then started tinkering with maybe they could use those same tools to make a gun. The 17 in Glock 17 comes from, he had 16 other patents at that point. The 17th was for a plastic pistol design people seemed to like. Gaston's widowed wife, Catherine, used her husband's branding when she started her Glock Horse Performance Center, as well as a bunch of his money to get their services built up. He's also in some of their photos, which means, okay, he might not have been a horse cum aficionado, but the words Glock branded horse cum are both true and too good to pass up. There absolutely is a bottle of horse cum somewhere with a Glock Perfection sticker on it right above the name of the stud. That's... that's an image you'll need to wash out of your brain. Which you can do with Glock branded brainwash. Glocks are borderline sold like textiles. You pick the cloth and cut the length rather than wildly different products. And Glock's numbering system is designed specifically to piss me off. There's the 17 which is not based on the round count. There's the Glock 40, which is not chambered in 40, it's chambered in 10 millimeter. If you want a 40, you need the Glock 22. Oh, if you want a Glock chambered in 22, you need the 44. Uh, there is no Glock chambered in 44. However, the Glock 45 is the new nine mil for some reason. If you want a Glock in 45, you're looking for either the 21, the 41, or if you absolutely hate yourself, you're gonna use the 30 or 36. There is the 46, 
but it only exists because cops are idiots and having a disassembly involved pulling the trigger makes them shoot walls and knees and balls and babies next door. And since they're cops, nothing happens except they're given a gun you disassemble with a special little switch instead. There's also the 18, which has, and this is important, the funny switch. It's called that for two reasons. One, you cannot shoot a full auto gun without smiling. It is a physical impossibility. For another, you're going to laugh at how wildly inaccurate you are when you try and use it. Glocks are tiny and don't exactly leave a lot of room to grab in the first place. Speaking of war crimes, Walther is a company where you have to examine their history by starting with the question, yeah, but what were you doing in Germany 1934 to 1945? Yes, Walther made the P-38, the standard sidearm of the Nazis. They also made the PP and PPK, the sidearm of the SS. To be fair, a Walther also has the world record for most Hitlers killed, so that's a thing, certainly. And the Walther that existed up to World War II stopped existing for six years before being brought back because the West Germans needed pistols, and it was a lot easier to start with the pile of guns that already existed. That PPK also ended up being the Bond gun, by the way. Many of the first guns were either continuing designs, so the old supply of guns would have parts, or new designs that used some of the old parts, like the P5 using magazines and holsters from the P38. These days, you can still buy PPKs new from the factory, although honestly, if you do, I'm going to judge you at least a little bit. If you want a fun Bond gun, get a Bursa for a third the money. If you want something small to carry, hell, get one of Walther's modern guns if you need that Bond mystique. The PDP and CCP are relevant to folks buying guns today. And there are several similarly named guns as Walther has changed model designations and specifications over time depending on your needs and requests. Just remember there are zero points for drip when you fight for your life. CZ is yet another company that has its roots in Nazi gun design, but at least there's a lot of examples of sabotage and purposeful errors. Czechoslovakia was invaded by the Germans in 1938, and the consortium in charge of their guns sent some shit along with the folks who escaped, and more was hidden across the country, and production of replacement parts was slower with worse results. If you're a lefty in gun spaces, you'll see people use the CZ-75. That is the M9 for people who have a Starbucks order. There's also the P07 and P09. They're an interesting halfway point, as they are hammer-fired with an exposed hammer, but also polymer handguns. And like everybody else, they have the, the P10, which is their not-a-Glock CZ style. Sig Sauer is the corporate equivalent of a cannibalistic battle royale. Last company on Eaton wins. So, you know, capitalism. Originally, oh god, bear with me. Schweizenburg Wagenfabrik. A Swiss company, they developed this rifle, the Prelaz Brunam, and shifted into making rifles. They changed their name from Schloppycock Wiffleball to, ah, fuck, this, which when you shorten that, is sick. They developed the 210, which, okay, take an M1911, now make it Art Deco, and bam, you've got a SIG 210. It's bite the back of your hand levels of beautiful but also ridiculously expensive for a single-stack handgun. However, they want to export handguns, and the Swiss law says you can't, so they look for somebody to eat, I mean buy, and merge with. As partners. In friends. Sauer & Sons were a German gun firm started in the 1880s, which, like many gun firms in Germany post-World War II, were desperately looking to be bought out by somebody else. SIG comes along, offers to buy them, but allow them to retain some control over their industries. SIG Sauer is born, and most of the Sauer and some lines are killed off. Which, I'd care, but you're talking about guns that were built under the Wehrmacht, so... Womp womp. However, the German government really doesn't like the way that exports work when they aren't directly controlling those exports. And Sig Sauer liked making money, so they created this lamb in the U.S., fattened it up over time, planned to eat it, and in doing so, shift their manufacturing, and got a great lesson in American corporate takeover law. The American Sig Sauer bought out its European board of directors in a move that makes my brain hurt if I try to understand how a company made by another company can buy the one that made it. Guess the sheep was hungry. Six Sauer is now three separate companies, all controlled by their American counterpart. SIG developed the current generation of U.S. military sidearm, the M17-M18, based on the P320. 
these were picked because the military did comparison testing and everybody they tested seemed to be generally fine. Nobody stood out as awesome and SIG was cheap as fuck. Everybody and their mom picked up one as a result. Now, on the one hand, it's worth pointing out that the 320 without the external safety has a spicy concern with the hammer dropping if it's hit. However, even with the guns with the external safety, the ones that the U.S. military picked as the current generation of sidearm, they highlight something really important. The reason the military skipped past the 2011-style sexiness and two-pound competition triggers and advanced sighting systems others brought to the table was because, to the average person, the thing that makes the 320 worse, they're not things that your average person will miss a human-sized target at normal engagement's distance because of. High-level shooters, people who do competitions regularly, and are fast as fuck, boy! Okay, you'll start getting to the point where the gun might be the reason you're slower than you could be in specific situations. Most people, even most soldiers, the 320 is enough gun. Because frankly, most modern pistols that are reliable and can get an optic and a light mounted to them are enough gun for most missions. Yours included. What you have specifically matters way less than how you practice with it. That's the important thing. The arguments are silly. Instead of arguing online, go dry fire and practice more. Seriously, you know that take a lap meme? That. But like, dry fire reps. You know what? I'm instituting a thing on this channel. If you argue something pointless, or waste time on something that's bad for you, nope, do a set. That is going to be it for me, y'all. Thank you all for tuning in, I really do appreciate it. Thank you especially to all of my Patreon supporters. I wouldn't be able to make this content without y'all, so seriously, thank you for uh, supporting me on Patreon. It, it means the world. It, it, well, this channel is entirely supported by viewers. That's the way we get your support, because we're never getting monetized if we're realistic. So um, we do have the... You can uh, sign up to support us on YouTube itself now. Uh, although... Patreon is still the best way to get access to everything. So thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Stay dangerous, y'all. Keep each other safe. And remember, moral doesn't mean legal. And Stonewall was a goddamn riot. Peace.